and he is seriously so hungry for the word of God and the things of God, and God is doing such an awesome work in Carson's life. So he's going to share a little bit about retreat, and uh, and I'm going to give him a few minutes here. Does this thing work? All right. <laughs> well, what I was planning to do is I was planning to talk about all the fun things we did, like the, the giant swing you saw, the zip lining, and the kayaking. But during the first song, like, I felt a word from God, and he wanted me to talk about a mistake I made going into retreat. I thought retreat was about all the fun things we do while we're there. I thought it was about, well, it, it is about building, like, camaraderie around, like, each other and building with each other in our faith. But my mistake was I thought it was just about the fun activities. And I grew complacent. I was like, well, I'm going to go to retreat, and I'll do these fun things, and, and it'll just be a normal church service, and I'll just get through it, and we'll do the same thing tomorrow and have fun. But when I got there... I felt, I felt changed. I felt different after. Like forgiveness, like it came into my heart. And if I can say one thing, is just expect the unexpected sometimes with God. And so I didn't expect to feel that. And so I just want to leave you with that. Come on. <laughs> you, you go and get the microphone. Let you preach sometime. Hallelujah. Hey Amen. I'm going to get right into my sermon. I am going to condense it. Uh, I don't think we're going to do what we had originally planned, guys, because it's going to drag on too much. I'm sorry. We had a nice drama we were going to perform in the middle of my sermon tonight, but I think we're going to have to forego it. Uh, Strategically placed in the middle of what would be our history book, the Old Testament, we find a dramatic and engaging story. The story of a righteous man that we know he was named Job. And tonight, I just, I'm going to take a few minutes, and I want to preach on the tale of a righteous man. The Bible clearly states that in his day, Job was a wealthy man. In modern day, he would have no doubt been a multi-millionaire. In ancient times, the Bible states that he was blessed with children and livestock, so much livestock. And the reason that this was so important was it was painting a picture that this man literally had it all. In modern day terms, he had the the beachfront house, he had the mansion, he had the airplane, he had the cars, he had it all. But in painting this picture, the Bible records something truly unique about this man. It says that he was a perfect and upright man, one that feared God and shunned evil. And so you can grab that picture that there was a man who was blessed with material wealth, and blessed with substance, but he still knew where God's place was in his life. He was so concerned about his relationship with God. The Bible says that his children would often throw parties, and that that just sound like the children of millionaires, right? They would throw parties. And the Bible says in Job 1 and 5, and it says, And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned. Maybe that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Job just thought maybe his sons had sinned against God. And he was so concerned about his family's status with God that he went and sacrificed on a maybe sin. And you understand that this man was in a place where he could have easily called a servant to come and offer the sacrifices. He could have easily called one of his sons and said, come on, y'all want to party all night? You go in and offer this sacrifice. But Job was so concerned about his standing with God that off a maybe sin, he performed sacrifices. What a beautiful picture of a man who really had a heart after God and after the things of God. He was a perfect man, an upright man. He loved God. He loved the things of God. And this is the tale of a righteous man. We know the story goes, and I was going to read it, but I'm not going to read it now for the, to condense time. But how Satan comes to God. And so many people get this story wrong because they think that Satan went to God asking about Job, but that is not what happened. 
Satan went to God and said, I've been going all over the earth seeking whom I may devour. And God said, hath thou considered my servant Job? So we have a man that loves God so much. It's painted this picture that he's a millionaire, but he still fears God. He still offers sacrifices unto God. And God says, have you considered this perfect man? His name Job. And oh, I wish we could do the drama that we were going to do. But if you read that first chapter of Job, literally boggles my mind. Because in one instance, four messengers came to Job and said, your cattle are gone, your camels are gone, your oxen are gone, your sheep are gone. And the last messenger comes and says, your children have been killed in an accident. This literally happened in a moment. If this would have happened in a year's time, it would have been too short of time. If it would have happened in a month's time, it would have been too short of a time. But it literally happened in a moment. And the Bible says that Job stood up, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground, and worshipped. Come on, I said he worshipped. When everything was taken away from him, when everything that made him who he was, he worshiped and blessed the name of the Lord. Come on, I said he didn't even have the Holy Ghost. He wasn't even baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the only covenant name. And when everything was stripped away, he worshiped. Boy, I was so tired. I'm so tired. The kids wanted to do an impromptu stay all day at the church. Whew. And I'm tired. And I get in here and I'm like, Taylor, all right, here's what you're going to do. If you're going to preach tonight, you're going to take it easy during worship. You're going to have the energy, you know, to speak, you know. And I'm coming up here, I'm praying with people, I'm shouting at the top of my lungs, and I'm like, Lord, but you know what? There's just something about worship that it can literally pull something out of you because it's connecting you to a higher power, it's connecting you to a higher source. And his name is Jesus Christ. Moving along, this is a tale of a righteous man. Satan's agenda is found in Job 1 and 11, and he said simply that he wanted Job to curse God to his face. That's what the enemy wanted. That was the result he wanted to pull out of Job, is that he would curse God. And so we see in chapter 2 that his wife comes to him after all of these things have happened, because now not only was his livestock taken away, now not only was his children taken away, but his body had been touched with disease, and he was absolutely miserable. Wife goes to him, says, why don't you just curse God and die? Curse him and die. Everything's been stripped away. Curse God and die. And we know that he says, Woman, you speak like a foolish child. I'm not going to do that. Can I only receive good things at the hand of God? Shall I not also receive bad things? His heart remained intact. His spirit remained intact. But here's where I want to go. How does Job get to a place where he could curse God? That was the devil's agenda. That was the devil's assignment to get Job to curse God. How could he bring him to a place to curse God, the tale of a righteous man. I didn't read the text, but each one of the persecutions that came against Job were tied to a group of people. The Chaldeans came and took his camels. The, what were the S names? Help me out here, the S names. The Sabians came and took his livestock. And so Satan's attack involved other people. It wasn't just Satan coming at him. He was involving other people. So I'm going to get real short with you tonight. How does God, or how does the enemy get someone to curse God? He builds unforgiveness and bitterness in the heart of a person, and that road of bitterness will lead you to a place where if you're not careful, you'll end up cursing God. If you let that simmer in your heart, 
that this person did this to me or this person is doing this to me and you let it fester long enough, you'll be surprised how you'll begin to curse the things of God. I don't want to go to church. Those people, they hurt me there. Those people, they did that to me there. That person was supposed to be a Christian, and they hurt me. And if you don't keep your spirit right, it's a dangerous road. It's the tale of a righteous man. Bitterness is such a dangerous thing. 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11 says, To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything to whom I forgive it for your sakes, I in the person of Christ. So I'm using Christ and I forgive other people. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. Yes, this is kind of a part of what I preached on that night. Satan gets an advantage in your life when unforgiveness creeps in. Ephesians 6 and 12 says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You have to understand the value of your soul and that there is a war. Come on, you hear me? There is a war going on for your soul. Your soul. Unforgiveness towards another person. The greatest advantage the devil has in our lives. The devil will use people and situations to hurt you. He will. And here's the thing about Satan. He's not fair. He doesn't have lines. He doesn't have boundaries. You, you know, me and you, we'd be like, well, look, let's just take half his donkeys. Let's just take half his camels. And let's just take half of his kids, right? That would be enough to drive him crazy and get him to curse God. The devil said no. I'm going to take all of it. He has no boundaries. And you know why? Because the devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Let me give you a word. Don't play with the devil. <laughs> Don't play with evil and with the devil. And I'm going to say something about Halloween. Don't get involved in it. You play with the devil and you're going to end up stealed, killed, and destroyed. And that's not what the children of God want. Life and pain affect everybody at some point unforgiveness leads to bitterness and bitterness will lead to hatred and hate is a blindfold it's a fuel to do and to act in ways that you could never do by yourself we hear about all these shootings and we ask how could you do that how could you run up in a church with people sitting there innocently not armed and open fire on family on children because hate will draw people to do things that they never thought they could do. And I would love to go back in the storyline of these people and see where they were hurt. And it started with unforgiveness towards a dad that beat them. Or towards an uncle that did something to them. Because it's such a powerful thing. God is love. He births love. That's who he is. That's what he does. When I look around and I see God moving over people or when God moves over me, I see the expression of his love. And if God is love, there is another opponent who dwells in hate. And that's where he's trying to get you and me into a place of hatred. Love is the most powerful force in the universe. You understand that it was God's love that pulled him from eternity into time. It was his love that wrapped him in a fleshly body. It is the most powerful force in the universe. And the highest form of love is forgiveness. You understand what I'm saying right now? No greater force in the world than love. And the highest form of love it's forgiveness. What do they say about marriages? They don't fall out of love. They fall out of forgiveness. Because there's a power in forgiveness that the devil wants to keep you from. So we're going tonight. The Holy Ghost is moving. I had so many scriptures on forgiveness that I am going to skip. We're going tonight. 
And as the Holy Ghost is ministering and moving tonight, I begin to see just a cross. Not a cross. You know, I don't see it. I'm feeling it, right? I'm feeling what the Spirit's saying. It's not the enemy. But really, I'm seeing a cross. And I'm seeing all of your needs being placed on this cross, right? God's just tapping them to this cross. Tapping them to this cross. Tapping them to this cross. And they're being held there on this cross. God, what do you want to do? I'm going to tell you about the tale of a righteous man. There was a man 2,000 years ago. He was a good man. He was the best man. He never hurt anybody. He never did wrong to anybody. He lived his whole life innocently in service of other people. He healed the sick, the lepers, the outcasts of society. He raised the dead. He fed the hungry. He clothed the homeless. He was the prostitutes and the criminals' best friend. He came to serve and to not be served. Innocent. This man was completely innocent. And one day, as he was going about his business, the Bible says that the hearts of the people turned on him. Crucify him. Hang him on a cross. Beat him. Scourge him. Make him suffer. Make his mom see it. Make his brothers see it. Make sure he's completely humiliated. The cold, hard death of a crucifixion. You see, it's the tale of a righteous man. You understand what I'm saying? There's something about trying to live a righteous life that's going to bring persecution. Jesus was innocent. Completely innocent. And when he was on that cross, naked, humiliated, bleeding to death, suffocating, the Spirit of God rose up in him and he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. You wonder, I wonder, why have things been allowed to come into my life that have literally stripped me of joy? Literally taken me to the place of almost not being able to get back up. God, why are you allowing these things into my life? Why are you telling the devil, has thou considered my servant, Taylor? Keep my name out of your mouth. Why? Why do you allow these things to come into my life? Matthew 6, 16, 24. Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. There was a day where every person in here, because you're at a church on a Sunday night, which typically means you're pretty committed to Christ because a lot of people don't come to church on Sunday. Not just here, but elsewhere. And there came a point in your life where you said, God, I'm in. I don't understand it all. I don't, I don't know it all, God. All I know is I feel something real. Hallelujah. Did we feel something real tonight? Who wants to go to a dead, washed-up church where the Spirit of God can't move? I feel something, God. And I want to serve you. And immediately, God foreordained a cross in your life to cause pain, humility, and suffering. But you know why? You know why? I I don't even know how to say this, really, but I would not have put what we had to go through with my son for anything to be told by the doctors that we had a cyst. You know how many people have healthy babies? And you know, I ain't gonna lie, I told God. I'm like, God, I'm doing your work, Lord. I'm doing what you want me to do. I could be making double my income. 
I could be doing something else. I'm here doing your work. You couldn't have let this go to somebody else. You couldn't have let this transfer to somebody else. You had to, I got family members, man. They don't care about living for you, God. Can't you send it their way? Your flesh will say things to you like that. Don't act like that. We all, you know what I'm saying. Let them deal with it. But you know what? We dealt with it, and God brought us through, and it unlocked something in me. A few weeks later, I mentioned it tonight, my brother and, and Jenica, they were in the hospital, in and out of the hospital. Uh, I'm not going to explain all the complications. They were having complications, and they said, you're fixing to have this baby. She's on t- short-term disability. And you know what? Josh texted me, and they thought I was joking. I'm not pinning a rose on my nose, okay? That's not what I'm doing. But I said, tell me the day you want to have that baby. I'm making a public confession right now. Was this not like six weeks ago, and the doctors were telling them they were going to have that baby? Four weeks ago. I said, what day do y'all want to have that baby? They said, November 25th. I said, okay. See, I had already been through that persecution, and I went through it without getting bitter at God, and it unlocked a power in me, and I went to God, and I said, God, I said, in the name of Jesus, I said, that baby's going to be born on November 25th. I said, in the name of Jesus. And because I had allowed myself to go through that persecution and that bitterness didn't destroy me, it gave me something. We're not here for us. We're here for other people. And you're going to come across people who aren't going through patty cake situations. They're dealing with sin, and the wages of sin is they're dealing with deathly situations. And if we're going to impact this world, when was the peak of Jesus' power? Was it when he healed 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 the lepers? Was it when he raised the dead? Was it when he multitude or multiplied the loaves and the bread? No, that was not the peak of Jesus' ministry. The peak of Jesus' ministry is when he was innocently on that cross and he was purchasing the salvation of billions of people. So whatever that cross is in your life that you don't understand, that's bringing you pain and humility and you don't understand why God is allowing this to happen, keep your spirit right. Don't hate anybody. Don't let that get into your spirit where you don't like somebody or you can't see somebody coming for hatred in your heart. It'll destroy you. But more than that, there's going to be somebody one day that's going to need your ministering touch. You're going to be at work someday and somebody's going to be talking to you. And there's going to be something in your heart. And tears are going to well up in your eyes. And the Holy Ghost is going to come over you. And you're going to say, let me tell you something. November 25th is when that baby is going to be born. Let me tell you something. I've been here. I've been persecuted in this way. I know God can bring you through. As we stand to our feet tonight, we've had a wonderful move of the Holy Ghost. I'm telling somebody tonight, if this sermon... That it's very possible that the thing that you were requesting from God or are requesting from God might be tied to forgiveness towards somebody else. Right. You might be like the Savior, all tied up on a tree, being crucified. And all of eternity is waiting to hear three words. All of eternity. You understand? If Jesus would not have fulfilled his mission, you and I wouldn't be here. My, ch- my child, Layla, wouldn't have been here singing Waymaker tonight as a three-year-old. We wouldn't be experiencing that. All of eternity was hinging on Jesus' ability to show us forgiveness. And so what I'm saying tonight is, Brother Taylor, I really don't have anybody that I need to forgive. Well, you must be in your glorified body here tonight. And come shake my hand after church, please. Because I want to see you. Because I'm telling you, You can peel back the layers of things in your life. And I'm telling you, you don't know what might be in your spirit that you don't even remember. But if you say, God, I want that power to minister to somebody. I want that authority 
to be able to call sickness out of people. I want it. God, search my heart. Search my spirit and create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew within me a right spirit. So my call tonight, you can pray at your seat. You can pray up here. You can do whatever you want. But I'm urging everyone under the sound of my voice, you don't know what might be tied to that forgiveness towards somebody. You don't know the miraculous that could break out in your home, on your workplace, in your finances, if you would just simply say, Father, forgive me. God, I forgive him if Job could do it. If Jesus could do it, you can do it. I can do it. That's the call tonight. Come on, the highest power in the world is love. And the highest form of love is forgiveness. What could happen if we got to a spirit of forgiveness right now? You're talking about a move. You're talking about a move of the Holy Ghost in this place.